Hey guys, and welcome to a lecture on China from the Qin through the Han Dynasty. If you'll notice, Chapter 7 of Spodek actually goes a little bit further than that, but we're only going to focus on this section, and we're going to actually break it into two parts, and this is the first of the two. As usual, here are your key concepts I want you guys to be familiar with by the end of the presentation, but do not forget about Conrad Demarest. Remember, the Han Dynasty is one of the three empires that's compared on that model. But also think about the dynastic cycle, because again, we're back in China and that cycle still applies, that framework still applies. And don't forget about Spodex reasons for why empires are successful and um, why they fail. Take a few more moments to go ahead and read these key concepts. And here's our key vocabulary for this lecture. These are all pretty important, but these here, one, two, and three, legalism, Confucianism, and Taoism are the biggest three from this lecture. These three represent three really important philosophies that come out of China around this time period. And as we're going to see in a little bit, I hope, all three of them still have their impacts felt in China today. So definitely focus on these three. So today we're talking about China's unification. And this date up here is a little bit confusing because what it really corresponds to is all the dynasties that are covered in Chapter 7 of Spodek. But the Qin Dynasty and the Han Dynasty only go from about the 200s BCE to the 200s CE. So we'll be stopping somewhere in the middle of this timeline today. And I like to start with an image of the Great Wall, not just because the Great Wall of China is probably the first thing many of us think about when we think about ancient China, but also because the Great Wall is somewhat of a symbol of Chinese unity, a symbol of Chinese governmental authority and power. Because really what it is, is monumental architecture, right? It's not monumental architecture for a religious purpose, like the ziggurats were, or like the pyramids were, but it still is something that takes a tremendous amount of organization to put together and to maintain. And throughout the years and throughout the dynasties, this wall has been built, has crumbled, has been rebuilt, has crumbled again, and has been rebuilt again, until it is as it appears today. And that's interesting to note because the strength or lack thereof of the Great Wall at any given time in Chinese history can really tell us something about the strength of the government that was in power at the time. If you have a strong wall like this is, you probably have a pretty strong organized government able to maintain it. If your wall has fallen into disrepair, think about crumbling infrastructure in the dynastic cycle. That probably means that your government too has also fallen into disrepair. So I love to use the connection between the physical structure of the wall and the governmental structure at any given time. It's also um, good to note that the Qin Dynasty, which is the first we'll be talking about today, was the first to make major improvements to the wall and to connect it into something sort of resembling what we know today. Not quite here yet, this was done by the much later Ming Dynasty, but it was much closer to this than anything the Zhou or the Shang before them had ever done or thought about doing. like I said, today we're talking about the Qin Dynasty. I know it looks like Quinn, but it's pronounced Qin. Um, but how do we get there? To get there, we have to kind of go through a recap, right? We had the 
Jia Dynasty, which some historians say is a real thing and some aren't so sure about. This is about how long it lasted. Then we have the Shang Dynasty, which we talked about last time we were in China. Then we have the Zhou Dynasty, and then the Qin. Okay. To recap, um, if you're looking at your Chinese dynasty song, that might be a good thing to have with you right now, just so you can take notes on the major things to remember about each of the dynasties we've talked about so far. For Jia, uh, it's not really on there, but I might write it off to the side and say, you know, maybe fictional, maybe not, still historical debate about that. For Shang, the major thing I would write is writing. Remember. Uh, they were the ones who, who created the oracle bones. We have the first written record from China. Um, for Zhou, the big idea for the Zhou is the mandate of heaven, right? In the beginning of the dynastic cycle, the Zhou were the first to say that the Shang should be kicked out of power because the forces of nature were not on their side because they were no longer good rulers. And the Qin used that mandate of heaven, the same thing that the Zhou came up with, to eventually kick the Zhou out of power. And the Qin come into power um, around 200 BCE. They don't last that long, but you're going to see they do some great things while they are in power. I sort of talked about where the Zhou went uh, in that recap there. Um, and you'll hopefully see some connections to the dynastic cycle in some of these things. What themes are we talking about? Well, you know, whenever we talk about politics, it's got to be theme three, right? Whoa, okay, what just happened? I just jumped a full 2,000 years in the future. I was just back here talking about the Qin Dynasty and Qin Shi Huangdi, and all of a sudden I've got a picture of Mao Zedong. No, I'm not going crazy. Um, but the reason I've showed you these two Chinese leaders who are so very far apart time-wise is because it's a big comparison I'll be trying to make between the two, and those big comparisons uh, is what the AP exam will ask you oftentimes to do. How are we going to compare Qin Shi Huangdi, who you saw on the last slide, to Mao Zedong here? Well, let's talk about their styles of leadership. Um, if you're not familiar with the word totalitarian, some historians have argued that Qin Shi Huangdi, this guy from the last slide here, the first emperor of the Qin dynasty, qualifies as a totalitarian. What the heck is a totalitarian and what separates it from a dictator? When I think of the word totalitarian, I focus on the part that says total, as in total control. A totalitarian is someone who seeks not only to control his or her people's actions, but also their thoughts. You want control if you're a totalitarian on such a total level that you can control what your people are thinking, not just what they're doing. Uh, and that's tough to accomplish, but it hasn't stopped many people from trying. Uh, Mao Zedong is definitely one person who has tried to do that in more recent history through the use of propaganda, um, through the use of campaigns to censor anyone who spoke out against him, um, through the use of campaigns to destroy the um, creative works of anybody who criticized his ideas. So that's part of what makes him a totalitarian. Um, a dictator, on the other hand, is just someone who tells you what to do and tries to control what you do. Um, they don't go so far as to try to control your thoughts. The question is, was Shi Huangdi a totalitarian just like his counterpart Mao Zedong was a uh, full 2,000 plus years in the future? Let's try to answer that question. OK, 
Okay, so this little chart here that has the words dictator and totalitarian on it uh, is surrounded by a bunch of different things that Qin Shi Huangdi, the first emperor of the Qin dynasty, did during his time in power. Using your knowledge of the words dictator and totalitarian, I'd like you guys to classify these actions. Okay, Each one of these things, does it sound like something a dictator would do? Someone who is just trying to control his people's actions? Or does it sound like something a totalitarian would do? Someone who is trying to control their thoughts as well as their actions. Go ahead and take three minutes and decide for yourself where you would place these. I'll be back with you shortly. Okay, so before we start sorting these things, I want to explain to you guys why I decided to lay this chart out the way I did. The totalitarian circle is contained inside the dictator circle because all totalitarians are dictators. That is, if you're trying to control someone's thoughts, you're trying to control them in order to also control their actions. Whereas, if you're trying to control someone's actions alone, you're not necessarily trying to control their thoughts. So, let's see where you guys decide to put these and where I put them. Starting with this one up here. Burning books with different philosophies from your own. Well, that sounds like it's an attempt at thought control, right? So that would be totalitarian. Uh, moving noble families to the capital city where he can keep an eye on them. Well, we don't know what he was doing while those families were under his watch. Um, so we can't say he went so far as to try to control their thoughts, but we do know that he told them what to do. So that would be something that a dictator would do. Um, sending new governors to rule territories in place of those noble families. Uh, we again don't know what he ordered those governors to do while they were there, but we do know he's doing some ordering of people's actions, so that's definitely dictator. And then killing Confucian scholars. If you guys didn't know, Confucianism was one of those philosophies that was different from the one that Qin Shi Huangdi himself believed in, and in removing those opposing scholars, you are trying to limit their message and control people's thoughts. Okay, so if I left it at that, and that was all I told you about Qin Shi Huangdi, you'd think he's a pretty bad guy, right? But he did other stuff too, actually. He was really big on standardization. He standardized everything from the written language to a system of measurements to laws. And that might not sound like a big deal, but when you're trying to get everybody in the territory the size of the United States almost to come up with the same writing system, the same written language, 200 years BCE, that's quite an accomplishment. And even today, um, the writing system, the written language of China, even though the spoken language is not standardized, the writing system and the written language is. So we thank Qin Shi Huangdi for that. He also standardized measurements. Imagine how difficult it was to trade um, if you weren't dealing in the same amount of weights and measures. Imagine how difficult it would be to build something if you were using materials from different provinces. Qin Shi Huangdi changed all that. Um, and he standardized the law. The law was the same for everybody in the whole of his empire. So it was more predictable. You knew what the laws were. You knew what the consequences were. You might see in a bit that those were pretty harsh rules and harsh consequences. But at least you knew what they were. What else did he do? He offered protection. Uh, protection from invaders by finally connecting that great wall. Unfortunately, a lot of folks died building it, um, but he did get it built. Uh, and other improvements to infrastructure, improvements to roads, improvements to irrigation. Roads, of course, are things that help us to communicate, to spread ideas. Um, and this kind of goes hand in hand 
with their standardization of measurements and writing system because it's easier to communicate those uh, standardizations and law as well if you have the roads to do that. And of course irrigation. It's the basis of any agricultural economy and Qin Shi or Huang Di really really propped it up. Does any of this stuff sound familiar? Protecting people from invaders, improving the infrastructure, if that sounds like a certain cycle you've heard about before, then you're thinking along the right lines. So I didn't tell you this before, but Qin Shi Huangdi's style of rule, those strict rules, those harsh punishments, that goes in line with the philosophy called legalism, which we'll talk more about in a second. But legalism was not too popular with the majority of people. The folks in control like it because they believed it organized society the way they wanted and kept people in line, but the harshness of it all really did not sit well with most of the commoners, especially the peasants. And so eventually some peasants from the land of Han revolt against the Qin Dynasty. They say, you've been treating us unfairly and you've lost, wait for it, the mandate of heaven and now we have it and we're going to take control and set up a new dynasty and we'll conveniently call it the Han Dynasty. And like I said, it lasts for about 400 years from 200 BCE, 200 CE. Peasant revolts, mandate of heaven, what does this sound like? You guessed it, it's our good old friend, the dynastic cycle. So let's take a brief look at this before we move on, right? When Qin Shi Huangdi was doing well, when the Qin Dynasty was doing well, there was peace. There was a building or rebuilding of infrastructure. Think the Great Wall, think the roads, think the irrigation, right? Um, and peasants are benefiting from that. Uh, when it becomes the old dynasty, relatively quickly, um, those harsh laws, treating people unfairly. Han comes around, says you've lost the mandate of heaven. There's that peasant revolt of the Han, and the Han becomes the new dynasty. Okay, so really quickly, let's talk philosophy. Three big Chinese philosophies from this time period you need to know, and the most important things you need to know about them. Obviously, there's much more information in Spodek. I encourage you to take note of that information, but we're going to be focusing on the stuff that's here for right now is the most important stuff. All right, so let's talk about Taoism really quick, also known as Taoism. The big thing you should remember about Taoism or Taoism is that it believes in doing everything naturally. That is, there is a natural order to things. That natural order is called the Tao. And you should not be in opposition to that natural order. Politically, Taoists believe that government is a human invention. And because government is a human invention, it is by definition unnatural to have any kind of government. Anything that humans create um, goes against nature. Government is a human creation. It goes against nature. You shouldn't have it. So Taoists are kind of like peaceful hippie slash anarchists. That's the way I kind of look at them. Okay, they say follow nature's laws. Nature has already given us laws. We don't need humans to create new laws for us. Okay, that's Taoism in a nutshell. Moving on to Confucianism. Confucianism does believe in government, but it believes in a certain type of government. Um, not only a relationship with the people in government and their followers, but also a relationship uh, between people in society that helps the social order kind of govern itself. So Confucianism believes that a successful society is based on five major relationships. Those are right here. Ruler and subject, father and son, husband and wife, older brother, younger brothers, and friends. Um, what specifically are we talking about with these relationships? Well, the first three 
one, two, three, are kind of a relationship of respect and obedience, or kindness and obedience, or magnanimity and obedience, or however you want to put it. Um, with the first one, the ruler should be kind um, and gentle and respectful of his subjects. But the subject, r realizing and recognizing that the ruler is kind and gentle and respectful of his or her needs and wants, should be obedient and also respectful of the ruler. The father should be understanding and respectful of his son's needs and wants. Um, but in turn, the son should be obedient to the father. Uh, the husband should be understanding and respectful of his wife's needs and wants. But the wife, again, should be obedient to her husband. So that's the policy of mutual respect, um, kindness on the one hand, and returned respect and obedience on the other. Okay, these two are not nearly as important, I think, as the first three to understand in Confucianism. So we're going to stick with those. Also, Confucianism believes that humans are naturally good. And that's in direct opposition to legalism. Legalism, like I said before, was the philosophy that Qin Shi Huangdi believed in. And legalism says that humans are naturally bad. And because they're naturally bad, you need something to control them for the good of society. That something is harsh punishments. That something is strict rules for those people. If they don't follow those rules, that's where the harsh punishments come into play. So for legalism, think rules and restrictions, regulations, punishments. For Confucianism, think, yes, rules, but more so unwritten, understood rules that society as a whole follows rather than a ruler or a leader imposing those rules and restrictions on the people forcefully. Okay, so I normally do my why do we care at the end, but really briefly let's talk about why do we care about these three philosophies in China today. Um, well, they leave us with a couple really important um, uh, legacies. First of all, Taoism, like I said, they're into doing everything naturally. And that applies to medicine as much as it does to government. So acupuncture, many historians believe, is actually a product of Taoist beliefs. And Taoism still gets cited by environmental activists in China today. When China was preparing for the uh, 2008 Olympics in Beijing and there was all that smog in the air and there, were, there was all this environmental degradation. Uh, Taoists started to come out of the woodwork and say, hey, this is us going against nature and now the whole world can see um, the problems we've created for ourselves. So it's interesting that Taoism still makes appearances from time to time in environmental politics in China. Uh, Confucianism continue that whole concept of filial piety from the Shang Dynasty. If you aren't aware or forgot what filial piety is, it's that notion that sons and daughters should be respectful of their parents, should serve their parents. Um, Shang Dynasty did that um, because of ancestor worship. Remember, they believed that your ancestor spirits would either help or harm you, um, Confucianism kept it alive not for the same reasons, but because it was part of one of those five relationships. Remember the father-son relationship. The son is obedient to the father. So it keeps alive that tradition of filial piety or obedience um, of a son or daughter to their parents. And legalism. Some concepts from legalism, especially that idea of total control of the population, were adopted by much later rulers, like that um, like that person Mao Zedong I showed you guys um, near the beginning of this lecture. Alright, that does it for Qin Dynasty China. On to the Han. Remember the Han 
dynasty ruled from the 200s BCE to 200 CE. It's important to note that this time period is around the same time as the high point of the Roman Empire. Okay, remember that that's one of the reasons that the Romans and the Han get compared so much. And as you'll read in the textbook, there was a lot of trade and cultural exchange going on between those two empires as well. This is Liu Bang, the first emperor of the Han. Uh, it's interesting to note he came from that, that uh, peasant background. Um, remember, it was a peasant revolt that gave him power and overthrew the Qin, but he seemed to enjoy the high life based on this illustration, at least. Okay, so at the beginning of this lecture, I gave you guys the brief rundown of all the dynasties leading up to the Qin. And I said it would be a good idea if you had that Chinese dynasty song with you so you could take a brief note of the most important things that each one of them did. So for the Qin dynasty, you should be thinking legalism. That was the big thing that they introduced to society. Also those standardizations, right? Standardizing the measurements, standardizing the language is a big one, standardizing the law, um, and making those infrastructural improvements. But the big things for Qin were legalism and standardization. For the Han, one of the biggest things is going to be Confucianism, because Confucianism replaced legalism as a dominant government philosophy under the Han. Um, and what did that mean? Well, it meant that the Han were interested in educating their government officials because, after all, according to Confucianism, government officials were supposed to be good. They were supposed to have earned the respect of their people through their good deeds and their caring for the people and their good ability. Um, that's one thing they're supposed to have. So that's one thing the Han wanted to see in their officials. Um, and also they formalized rules of social conduct, which you'll see in the document Lessons for Women. So especially for women, um, rules for social conduct were formalized. Why? Again, it's Confucianism. Confucianism believed in having obedient wives, right? Subservient wives. And so we see that reflected in the documents that come out of this, um, this society. What themes do you see reflected here? Hopefully three, talking about politics a little bit. Hopefully five, we're talking about social structures, namely gender relations. So I just made it seem like the Qin and the Han were two completely different dynasties. And of course they were very different in many ways, but they also shared some pretty key similarities. Um, for one, when they were strong, they had military dominance. How they achieved that? Oftentimes through forced service for all males who were able. Why were they so interested in having that military dominance? Well, because if you remember from the first lecture on China, all the way back to River Valley, China, there are these constant threats from the north, these nomadic peoples who at times like to invade and raid and steal your stuff uh, and disrupt your society. Um, the Han dealt with a group called the Zhongnu, or some folks call them the Zwingna, or you might know them as the Huns. There's another Mulan reference for you, right? Um, but these northern invaders, they're constant threats for Chinese dynasties, not just the Qin, not just the Han, but almost every dynasty we're going to see in the future as well. And something they both shared again was their belief in a strong government bureaucracy. The Qin had a different idea of how that government was supposed to rule, but they both had a very centralized government and they both had lots of officials that helped to run that centralized government. 
By the way, if any of you guys are thinking that these Xiongnu warriors look anything like the Mongols, yeah, they do, because they're kind of the ancestors of the Mongols. So we're going to see later Chinese dynasties dealing with the Mongols the same way the Han deal with the Xiongnu. Alright, so you guys have seen this map before, right? I showed it to you the first time we discussed um, Silk Road trade from Mediterranean Roman Empire all the way east to China and vice versa. It's a map that applies here as well because the Chinese Empire the Romans were trading with was the Han. So take what I said about Roman trade and kind of apply it to China here because of course it applies in both scenarios. Um, Han China traded indirectly with people as far away as the Roman Empire and remember they were sending silk, they were sending spices to the west in return for precious metals that were flowing east. And that was one way that the Chinese economy um, developed and grew. Another way was through tribute. Tribute, if you guys didn't know, is like a forced gift, okay? Don't think Hunger Games, we're not talking about tribute in the form of people here, we're talking about tribute in the form of items. And when the Han Dynasty's military was really strong, it could actually extract tribute from the Xiongnu, the nomadic peoples up to its north near Mongolia. What did the Xiongnu have that the Han Chinese wanted? primarily the horses they rode on. There were other things as well, but horses were a big, a big military asset for the Chinese. And we also see that sometimes when the dynasties in China, including the Han Dynasty, are weaker, that the tribute system works the other way, and the nomads to the north will actually extract tribute from the Chinese. They'll take their silk and their spices and their goods for themselves, instead of having the Chinese take their horses and other goods that they want. So tribute is a system, by the way, that works both ways, um, depending on who's got the military advantage over whom. Some other sources of Han wealth were its natural resources. Had a lot of iron, um, had a lot of salt, and I know those things don't sound like they're two incredibly valuable resources, but they're some of the early building blocks of basic economies and the Han used them with great success. What themes are we talking about here? We know we're talking about um, cultural exchange. And there was cultural exchange along these routes. Uh, we're talking about theme two, that's the interaction of cultures part. If we're talking about trade, that goes under the economic and that's theme four, so does tribute by the way. Um, interaction with the environment to produce these natural resources, that's theme one. Um, I didn't talk about this, but the whole tribute system is kind of a political system tied to the economy, so that could even be theme three. Pretty much every theme presents itself here. Alright, so I know I've already talked about this with you guys, so it should kind of be a no-brainer. But remember, when we trade goods, what do we also trade? Shouldn't need more than a few seconds to think about this. Well, it's ideas, right? It's culture. Um, and one of those big ideas or big aspects of culture that gets diffused to China during this time period is Buddhism. A lot of folks associate Buddhism with China because today, it's the biggest deal in China. Um, among other um, Eastern um, and Southeastern Asian countries. But Buddhism, a lot of folks aren't aware, actually started in India. Okay, that's really important for us to note. It starts in India, and we don't think of it as Indian today because Hinduism has all but kicked it out of there, but it starts in India. And traders who are moving along um, roads created for the purpose of Silk Road travel and trade are bringing Buddhism 
that religious idea with them. So again, they're trading not only goods, but also their ideas. We're going to be talking about Buddhism more later and see some documents about the interaction between Indian Buddhists and Chinese Buddhists. But for now, all you need to know is that Buddhism does not start in China, even though it's a really big deal there today. Okay, let's start talking about demography. I know that if you had human geography last year, you know a thing or two about the word demography um, and how it relates to population. Uh, what you should know about demography in Han Dynasty China during this time is that from about the year zero to um, almost the time when the Han Dynasty ends, there's a huge population shift in that territory. It's declining overall, but it's declining sharply in the north and actually increasing a little bit in the south. So if you haven't read this section of the chapter yet, I want you to think in terms of push-pull factors from human geography. What do you think might have accounted for these changes? We'll talk about them after you guys make your best guesses for three minutes. Okay, so what did you guys guess? Well, one thing that could be a push factor, if you're thinking back to the northern nomadic threats that the Han Dynasty constantly faced, could be warfare, right? Um, warfare that either killed or um, threatened the people living in the north, pushed them um, to the south. Something you might be thinking about for a pull factor um, might be something like job opportunities, right? That's a common answer that I get. Um, but remember the most common job for people at this time everywhere was farmer. So how do we translate job opportunities um, uh, to this time and place? it's probably going to be better farmland, right? Um, better farmland is going to make a difference if you're looking for that job opportunity because if your job is a farmer, you want to move um, where the farmland is fertile. Those are the two biggest answers I get in terms of popularity and they're the two that you want to be most familiar with. Um, what does this mean for the Han Dynasty? Well, all this warfare and destruction in the north meant that their borders were weakening, meant that their military strength was weakening around this time period. Um, they stopped protecting people, which makes us think they're getting toward that old dynasty um, side of things if we're dealing with a dynastic cycle. Um, talking about farmland kind of... Um, running out of its productivity in the north. That fits very well with the Conrad Demarest model. If successful empires are those with good farmland, then unsuccessful ones are those with bad farmland, right? And in the north, the farmland's starting to get overworked, overused. So that could also be a sign that things are not going so well for the Han Dynasty. Are there any other reasons you guys can think of for why the Han Dynasty fell? I'm going to let you guys make your best guesses, even if you haven't read the section about the Han Dynasty in the textbook yet, because you can probably make a pretty educated guess based on the pattern we've seen so far. Take a few minutes. You know what? You don't even need three. Take a minute. Tell me what you come up with after a minute's up. Here we are again at our friend, the dynastic cycle, right? Did you guess that they stopped protecting people? I already kind of talked about that. Did you guess that the infrastructure decayed? The great walls falling apart? The irrigation systems are falling apart? Did you guess they were treating people unfairly, perhaps taxing them too much, 
leading to a loss of the mandate of heaven? Yes, all of this stuff is happening. There's natural disasters, there's peasant revolts, invaders, the Huns are threatening, um, there's bandits raiding the countryside, there's lawlessness. It all leads to a period of disunity and chaos. And next time, we'll talk about how a new dynasty emerges, claims the mandate of heaven, and brings things back together. But before that, I know you thought I was done. Before that, one quick last slide for why do we care about the Han. Well, being around for 400 years and having a stable government can allow you to really make some pretty cool technological advances. And one thing that we remember the Han for is just that, advances in technology, especially the invention of paper and the compass. Those things are later on going to diffuse to the West through trade and going to be used especially by Europeans to further advance their society. But it's important to remember that those awesome inventions came from the East first. All right, that's it for the first part of our lecture. I'm sorry, guys, I know it was long, but it means that the second part of the chapter, the lecture that goes along with it, will be much shorter. Thanks so much for your attention, and I'll see you in class soon.